The million dollar question, how do entrepreneurs transition from self-employed to owning a business that turns a profit? My name is Chris Waters and this podcast has the million dollar answer. Welcome to CEO Secrets. Hey guys, it's your host, Chris Waters of CEO Secrets. I'm extremely excited to have a pretty incredible guest on the show today out of uh, California. He is a was started off as a real estate agent, became a top producing agent, built a Sotheby's office, and then ultimately became one of the most successful Keller Williams franchise owners or regional partners? Correct. Franchise owner. Franchise so, owners. Yeah. So you are, you're, you're helping KW take over Beverly Hills, Hollywood, that general area. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I got recruited a, a while back to be one of the first agents to, to really open up Los Angeles. It was kind of a land grab. So I started building out offices, invested in a few others. And then from there, I really went up to Northern California and built out Northern California as well. For anybody that doesn't know how the KW franchise system works, can you like, kind of explain the difference between regional partners and the franchisee owners? Yeah, the regional owners are the ones that originally bought the rights to the regions. And so when Gary uh, first built out the company and wanted to expand in North America, he sold regions and there, there's like 30 regions. And so he sold the rights to the regions and people paid for those investments. And then part of the requirement was, now I need to go out there and build all those regions out and find operators such as myself to go build out franchises. So the difference between a regional owner, a franchise owner, the way they make money is on the regional, on the royalties. So the royalties are split half between the regional owners and Keller Williams International. My ownership is based on GCI and profitability of the market center um, based on commissions and, and revenue. You know, I was looking on the KW website. I think they list publicly the average franchisee makes, I think was like 180, 190, 200,000. Does that sound about right? That's, uh, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me on average, which again, if I owned a McDonald's franchise, I'd expect it to be somewhere in the $50,000 range, right? So very different, very different models, but, but yeah, like yeah. Um, that's probably in their franchise disclosure. Cool. Well, Rick, I, uh, I want to take like 10 steps back because I kind of like dug right into it as I uh, went into your intro, but um, to, you know, get, share with the audience uh, more about your career and what you've done and I want to know more about you personally. Well, I, you know, I, my undergraduate degree, so I, I was a landscape architect by trade and was licensed in the state of California. And having done that, I was like, I, I didn't see that as the right path for me, even though I was really excelling at an early age. So I decided to go back to my MBA and that's where I really decided that like business and real estate was where I really was going to be happy. So as soon as I got out of MBA school, I literally went back and, um, and started my real estate career. And it's just exploded since there. So I consider myself more of an entrepreneur. The real estate was my way of, I saw, I saw an industry that I thought that I could go in and take market share pretty quickly and build a reputation. And I thought that the industry itself was at, already at a point of evolution. It's just magnified at this point. And I, and I realized that it could be the conduit for me to build a really big business. And so the reason for the attraction to Keller Williams, and so the company before Keller Williams was later after I had already left, had sold to Sotheby's. So it was, uh, it was a local high-end boutique um, that I was one of seven agents to start the Beverly Hills location that then later sold to, to Sotheby's. Man, I, I wish we had y'all sales prices down here. And as you might know, I'm down in Austin, Texas. I'm very yeah. jealous of those big, big uh, sales prices you guys have in Beverly Hills. Yeah, it's pretty astounding. Yeah, we're we're selling we're selling dirt for four million for a, you know for less than a ten thousand square foot lot. Wow, that's wild. Yeah. It seems like I mean in in that area with the commissions being so high, I mean you can make a lot of money as an agent, probably more than like a franchise franchisee owner. Oh, completely. I can make so much money money in the brokerage business being an agent than I can being what I'm doing. But for me, it's always been a path to something different. So I, you know, I'm inspired by helping people to succeed at high levels. And I really have, uh, you know, from an early age, I've always built businesses. I was, I was that kid who was 10 years old swapping, you know, pencils for five cents and make a penny on each, right? Like I'm that kid that like, I always figure out like how to rub 
two nickels together and make a couple cents. Exactly. So it's just, it's just my DNA. And um, as much as I love selling houses and things like that, the reality is like, I knew that I could impact more people by owning the businesses and really having a lot of agents and really making a difference in this industry. Again, I thought the industry, the level of standard isn't at the level it needs to be. And I always thought that this industry needed to, needed to be better. And so how many, how many franchise locations do you have, Rick? Currently um, nine franchise locations, but even within my franchise, I have most, a lot of my franchises have three and three or four locations. Okay. So if I were in a traditional model, those would be considered big, big offices. So some of those locations, you know, do 250 million just in a business center location. Do you know David Osborne? I do. He Is owns he, this region. He owns the region. Yes. Okay. And then he has a location in um, Dallas, right? Is that a franchise? Yes. Or yes. Franchise? So he owns franchises too under Go Management. So, which is uh, Smokey Garrett and David Osborne. So the Garrett Osborne Go Management. And then, so yeah, so that's, that's his uh, holding company that holds his real estate entities. And I believe it also holds his franchise ownership entity, which is the West Side, California, West Side, LA region. When, when did you get involved with KW? Like, when did you start buying franchises? I got into KW in 2003. Um, and, and again, was like the first agent of what was the home run launch that year. And I was an agent investor from day one. And then one of the principals, she and I went and opened my first franchise. And, two, and like literally within nine to 10 months, I already was one of the principal franchise owners. And then within a year, I was already on to opening Santa Monica, which is where I'm currently residing and, and where I'm sitting today. Cool. Santa Monica is amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Not, not cheap, but it's beautiful. The beach here, so yeah, not too bad. It's amazing. So, yeah. But yeah, you know, maybe. one thing I learned really early on is I was losing 30000 a month because I took on too much space and I was too arrogant to think that all these agents were just going to come because you know, I was a good guy and I knew how to run a business and, you know, and, and, but they didn't really know me and they didn't, you know, and they didn't know the brand and I I really had to get down and really work. And so I realized it wasn't about the view because I had a thousand square foot office. I overlooked the ocean. I was the guy, I was the CEO. Right. And so, so my ego got in the way of me being successful. And I, I realized early on that it wasn't about the view it was about the vision. And that I could have all the view in the world if I really had a strong vision. So I really focused on what a visionary leader would look like and roadmapped my way to where I'm at today. So that's a big, that's a big important thing that people, if there's one thing they take away today, it's, it's not about the title. It's not about where you're sitting now. It's about, do you have a vision big enough for the people in your um, umbrella and do you, even if you're starting from day one, like, do you have a vision about where you want to be and why is that important? Because if it's not about why it's important, then you're, you're just on someone else's journey. And so you got to have, something's got to drive you because those really hard days are 16 hour days and you're getting sued and you're getting beat up on all sides. I can go make more money somewhere else. And so I have to like, this vision's got to be strong enough to hold me through those tough days. Rick, what's your opinion on what's going on in the industry? Listen to Inman or any of the Facebook groups where a lot of real estate agents congregate. You know, there's a lot of uh, ex EXP people, uh, yeah, or ex KW people going to EXP. Like, what's your you know opinion about the future of Keller Williams as it relates to EXP and you know some of these people you know investing crazy amounts of money like Compass and uh, the I buyers? Yeah, I you know what I, I think. Like what Gary said is really true. It's like a vote of where you think the future is going to be and aligning with the future of real estate. I've never been more happy with where the direction of KW is going. You know, EXP pulled the trigger early and got their capital and they went public and all that. Like Gary waiting to the point where he's at right now, his ability to now infuse capital into the largest real estate company out there and then go exponentially double down and reinvest in certain areas such as really into the tech, into the marketing, into luxury, and really accelerate to the next level. 
I really believe that the, that Keller's going through a reinvention and we had a couple tough years behind us. And I believe that the, the opportunity in front of us is like, I've never ever experienced before. I've never seen better quality leadership as an entire leadership team um, that, that I, that I'm very closely aligned with that I can see the future of this company really going to not, not only remaining number one, but going to a place where we should be, which is, you know, like, where the second place runner up is so far behind us, it's almost untouchable. And, and I really believe that we are at that. Um, there's a bit of a flashpoint in the whole industry. I think it's gonna morph into very few brands. And I think there's gonna be a real exodus in the industry in general. And so I think that teams are gonna be the predominant players out there. And I'm turning my market centers into entire teams. What do I mean by that? Like. My, my market centers have to be a lead funnel to the agents to, to replace that of what they were getting from, say, Zillow and funnel leads in and promote them and, and give them the support and things. I want to, I want you to envision something and I'm, and I'm, and I'm also kind of curious if you've already looked into this, but if you go on uh, Redfin, for example, and certain markets across the country, you can use their app, right? To search homes for sale. You can use their app to open up a lockbox to Redfin listing, and then you can use the app without using an agent to make an offer. And they have this very, you know, smooth user interface to take you through the, you know, like a standardized contract, all the little, you know, data fields you got to fill in as an agent. It helps you fill that in. And then it uses machine learning and AI to tell you based off the kind of feedback the house is getting, you know, what you should offer, or you could put in a custom amount or whatever. Like that's a pretty good mousetrap. How do you, how do you see agents being able to, or KW or EXP or any of these people being able to compete with that? Because for example, Zillow and Redfin have so much mind share of the consumer. And if they build a very intuitive process to get the consumer in the house and submit an offer, and then for example, have like centralized, you know, market experts taking calls like a legalzoom.com, you know, you could really get a lot of efficiency out of um, what they're doing. What, what's your opinion of that? Have you looked into that? Have you seen what they're doing? I, I think it's a brilliant mousetrap and yet they've got the eyeballs in the front end, but when it comes down to actually wanting to pull the trigger and put an offer in, they want a local real estate expert who knows the nuances of, of what's happening in the areas that knows the schools. And it, you can look at all the data in the world and at the end of the day, you gotta, you gotta know what that house does and, 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 and the variables, right? Like for a small amount of money in the scheme of things, you can get real representation. Like there's, there are people that will go to LegalZoom and there's times that I've gone to LegalZoom, but if it's something important, like I want to build a company that I believe is going to be a hundred million dollar company, I'm not using LegalZoom's contracts. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to pay for the expertise of a top notch lawyer, just like I'm willing to pay for a top-notch realtor and not the cookie cutter. Here's the difference. In my marketplace, you could be on one side of a street and it's got a view of the ocean on the other side of the street. It's the same size lot. It's the same size house. It's the same amount of improvements. And one has a $2 million view premium. Their, their metrics can't account for that. Like when you're talking about luxury real estate, the, the difference between layout and finishes and, and the way, way houses operate, there can be such a huge range. If you were to look at a valuation and, and go to my website, my own personal house has a $500,000 variable between the Zestimate and some of the other, and Google's estimate and things like that. Like, like there's such a range. Like, why would you not get an agent when there's such a disparity? You know, so I do think that like in cookie cutter homes where they're virtually the same, where there's very little deviation, the only deviation is whether you're on, you know, whether you're on a, the busy street and on the corner or you're in the middle of the block, maybe there's a little bit of change there. And maybe in that scenario, they're going to corner the market, but in the luxury or higher end, they're going to have a very difficult time. So you, so like the middle of the bell curve where most of the transactions happen in the United States are between 250 and 750,000, which are primarily a lot of cookie cutter type houses that don't have the wide range of different materials used in construction, et cetera. So, I mean, you, one could argue that the, this mousetrap, these platforms are building could, you know, take a sizable chunk of, of market yep, share. Of course. Absolutely. 
I, I believe, I absolutely believe that. And, and again, so what, what I've done um, because of things like that, but I look at market compression from a lot of reasons. Uh, if you looked at Keller Williams international numbers and you look at GCI, if you look at, if you look at total GCI or you look at company dollar as a percentage of GCI, you look at the downward trends on that as it relates to the corporation. The same con compressions happening with agent commissions. They're moving downward and staying downward, right? So you look at those two metrics alone, and yet my cost is going up. So my cost of rent and my cost of staff continues to go up and up and up. My cap has stayed the same. My expenses are going up. My company dollars a percentage GCI is going down. So the only way to combat that, and, and every, that's why there's so much brokerage upheaval right now, because unless you're build, building a, um, an end-to-end -end consumer solution and you can monetize in the transactions multiple pieces of it, you're not going to stay around. And so I've got a lot of opportunities to buy market centers right now. I'm not going to buy. I'm going to wait. Like, unless they're going to build a mousetrap to, like I have, I'm, I'm just way in front of them. Like, I've been building this for years and I spent millions of dollars of my personal money to, to build it out. Like, you know, if you don't have solutions for these things, you're, you're going to get swallowed up. You're, you're just going to slowly die or you're going to sell. What's been the, um, it seems like there's been some reluctance for KW to build a national like lead gen platform. What's any idea what's prevented that from happening? Um, I think that they want like, I don't, I don't think it's out of the question at all. I think it's still being tossed around, but I think they want us to build our lead gen platform so we can actually have a way to make money because at the end of the day, they're a franchise based company, right? They want to keep their franchisees making money. They don't want to lose franchises, right? So their franchisees need to keep making money and keep building um, umbrellas. So the, the umbrella is built and our margins can grow bigger if we focus on building those lead gen mousetraps and providing our agents that lead flow, they're encouraging us to go do that. And because of it, we can actually net more money and keep the franchises alive and robust and making good money. So it seems like the KW is adjusting the playbook a little bit or the operating the they give to franchisees. Co correct. And I think that they need to because if they literally took every profit margin and we're just getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, eventually they won't even have a company because there'll be nobody that can afford or would like would take on the risk that we take on if the franchise was making 20 grand. Like, why would I do that? I could go for me. I could go sell not even one house, you know, like, yeah. Why would I do that? Rick, what's your ecosystem look like? Like, I'm just really curious. You've got these, all these franchise locations. What else are you involved in? So, so if you know what WeWorks are, I, I literally have coffee shops. So you walk into my coffee shop and if you're a coffee shop patron, you come in every day for the same cup of coffee. But while you're standing in line, you're looking at my insurance company and my insurance company literally could give you your, your home insurance. It could give you home life auto. We could do your health insurance, everything. And so the, the insurance company sits in the coffee shop and with TV monitors on saying, come on in and we'll give you a free insurance quote today. So our insurance is right there. Inside my coffee shop is also my mortgage company. And then while you're standing there, you look to the right and you actually see, imagine like an Apple Genius Bar and a Kinko's. So if you're a small time business, like uh, let's say you're dry cleaners down the street, we'll do your postcard mailings to say, hey, come into dry, dry cleaners for $5 off. We'll put you on our napkin holders in the coffee shop. We'll put you on our TV monitors with with um, ads that keep spinning. And then we charge you a flat fee per month for all that service. So we, we'll do small business solutions as it relates to um, like our own media platform that we've created. So we've got our own tech platform with a media component. And then we do our agents postcards. So our agents are just part of our long-term business model. It's all the small businesses out there that funnel through our printing platform and, and through our whole media channel. So that's, so those in addition to like escrow companies. So a consumer comes in and closes an escrow with us. The agent can come in and say, hey, you know, sit down here. The escrow officer is gonna come over. What do you wanna get for food at the coffee shop? We'll comp everything for them. 
insurance person come, come out and explain their insurance, do everything. And meanwhile, the customer's sitting there and we're creating the entire consumer experience around them. And we're getting paid on every pieces of those deals. And we're doing it for the benefit of the agent. Like, hey, I'm the insurance guy, but because you're one of Sally's premier clients, we want to give you this level of service and walk you through anything, any questions you might have. If there's anything that you need, we're here to support you. If you ever have a claim, here's my direct number. Um, you call me directly and I'll, uh, as one of Sally's good clients, I'm gonna make sure you get taken care of. Is that something you started from the ground up? Completely from the ground up. Cool. Yeah, and what here's the difference. Can Redfin, can Redfin replace that? They cannot get that close to the consumer. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So the consumer's on their own in that experience. Like, look at you can go to a Walmart and you can walk in and you can buy the merchandise and you can maybe get no, no, somebody to help you to try on clothes or do anything. Or you can go to a Nordstrom or Neiman Marcus or do something like that and get a clothes shopper to bring you different options and items, set up a, you know, kind of your wardrobe for you. They'll get you, you can get all that set up, right? So there's a level of service. So I'm going to err on the side of what can we do to change the agent and the consumer experience together. And by doing so, we'll have agent and consumer stickiness that will change the metrics. So the goal is like, how do we monetize that? Because if we, if the margin on the real estate broker side continues to contract at a level that it's contracting to, we have to have profit margins that can get paid a nickel here and a dollar there. And, and everything that I learned from when I was 10 years old, I'm, I'm just applying at a much higher level. And I'm, and I'm looking outside of our industry looking for different unique business models that have really good ideas and how do I bring that into our environment, replicate it in a way that makes sense. So we're basically a WeWork, but we really have business integrations of all the businesses we either built or we brought in to support, again, the, the agent and the consumer environment, whether That's we get paid cool. on it or not. It's, it's so kind yeah, of... That's all. More in the realm of on the investment side of things, the market's red hot right now. We're in a state of euphoria across most of the US. Like where are you personally investing money from a real estate perspective? Are you investing? Are you selling? Um, where are you at on the investment side? To be honest, I'm, I'm investing. So I, I do have real estate holdings and my, my real estate holdings have done really well for me. But the reality is I take my money and and for every dollar I make, I spend $2 on doubling down and investing in continued business growth. So I've got a business plan that has multiple um, additional companies coming on, like syndications and DSTs and all these other things that will be added onto the platform. Because as we build out these businesses that we already have, we can keep adding on new ventures that just add more money. Because I can go buy a, an apartment building and that's more of a passive you know, long-term hold situation. But when I invest money into a business, I'm actually feeding six or seven businesses, not one. Mm -hmm. And I'm not looking to retire right now. I'm looking to grow, right? So, so if, I, if I have an extra dollar laying around, I'm going to invest that dollar hoping I can make six. And by making six, it means I'm, I'm actually reducing my risk tolerance because I'm actually investing in stuff that, that I know is going to drive more business. So if I go buy another market center or build another market center, I already have the insurance company. Now I just have to give my insurance company access to a whole new market center. Does that make sense? Yeah, so sure. by, by bringing on another market center, I've not only increased my, my escrow, but it's the insurance and the TC and the disclosure company and, and the, and, 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 and it's all the other ands that, um, that allow and, and we do it in such a way where we really make it so that we're really giving the agents all the support at the lowest possible level we can so that way they can compete at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And then they couldn't go somewhere else and replicate that the same way. Hmm. So almost every dollar I make still goes back into building the empire and the mousetrap and the machine to continue and continue to build it for and on behalf of our agents like in your market where you're located, how much longer do you think we'll see this really strong bull market? I think this is a terrible market, to be honest. I think it's terrible to be a listing agent on some side because you, as a listing agent, like you get, you get 20 offers on a property, you got to tell 19 people you lost and say, you know, like, 
you know, why they didn't get it. And then you got 19 people thinking, well, did my offer get a fair shake? Like we went a hundred thousand over and we didn't get a counter offer back. Like what went on there? Right. So you're getting judged all the time and, and, and you're having to like deal with 19 and 20 offers and we're doing showings every 20 minutes and we have showings happening at 10 and 11 o'clock at night in order to be COVID protocol safe. And, and yet offers are being presented. So it's not a good balanced market. The best market is when there's enough supply and demand where, where we really have more of an equalized um, kind, of, kind of business. But this, this is an unsustainable growth. How long do you think it lasts? It, it can't last very much longer at, at this kind of level. It just can't. But that's why, they, you know, that's why interest rates going up isn't a bad thing. It's actually going to cool things slightly, which I think will bring more of a, a little bit of a calmness a little bit where there hopefully will be a little bit better balance on, on the business. You were, and, you know, I hear people thinking that the market's going to crash. The fundamentals um, don't allow it to crash. Like Dodd-Frank alone is one of the biggest reasons why it can't, can't crash like it did in 2008 because people are just not going to walk away from 30% equity in houses. And so many people have owned their house for a while now. They've, they've had to put 20% down and the market's gone up so much. They got another 10% of equity. So how many people are going to walk away from that percentage of equity? And there's now distribution models such as auctions and iBuyers and everything else that if you need to sell this week, you could sell this week. So the foreclosure market's not going to be the same. You've got different exit options now that didn't exist 12 years ago. So if, if you had a crystal ball, what do you think, what do you think is when the market kind of stabilizes or gets a little bit more? Stable? I actually think the market's going to continue. To, like if I looked at the price point by year end, I think that in my markets um, pretty consistently that we're still going to be higher. I just, I just had the California Association of Realtors head economist on and he expects it to go up almost 8% more, which is almost too high. I would say it's more like 5%, 6% would be... There's, there's a lot of people leaving California to come to Texas. Correct. Um, and yet your all's market is still on fire. Yeah. So it, like not, it, not enough people are, yeah. not enough. You know what? Are. Like it's, but here's, here's the thing. And I hear that about Manhattan too. You, like take my San Francisco market. Yeah. There's this big exodus and things like that. The only place that I really see it being affected more long-term is actually in the office office space and your core CBD on your triple net retail side. Let me explain why. If you're in a high rise building, there's still going to be apprehension about going back to your offices and being in a high rise. All those small little restaurants, sandwich shops, coffee shops, all around these high rises, their entire business is supported by all the people picking up coffee, going into work, their lunchtime crowd, their, you know, after work drinks, you know, picking up dinner and stuff like that as they go home. Those businesses are going to really, really be problematic, really suffer. Even parking lots, you know, because who's going to pay $30 to park now in a parking lot when the building itself is wide open and, mm -hmm. you know, it, they're not going in. And these, these office buildings are virtually vacant. So I do think that the office environment is going to be a challenge. But people will come back in and live back in San Francisco. It's a gorgeous city. Um, a bit of a, a, a drop in prices wouldn't be a bad thing, but the prices have still continued to go up. What market, are there any markets in California that are slightly depressed or down? Is that, is there any? I believe there's one county, but it's like down 1%, but you know, yeah. um, like it's Solano County, I'm not, I'm not positive. Nothing in my markets, everything in my markets are, are going up and I'm thrilled. Maybe, maybe in New York, that might be the only market where you can maybe get a deal. Yeah, and you know what? It's it, and it's the vertical inventory. So it's your high rise condos. Like, who's going to pay for a high HOA right now when you can't use the doorman or the valet or you can't use the pool, the gym? Like, why would you buy that inventory or go up the elevators with your dog twice a day um, and deal with that when you you know like in this environment that that market and that inventory is the hardest hit to be honest. But that's already coming back now that people are being vaccinated people are coming back in that housing stock will start to go back up. And once the investors start grabbing whatever inventory is out there and we start seeing that, it's gonna be like, in, like that will see a quick 
escalation bump um, that will probably exceed the same rate on um, single family homes in the same market territories. Rick, on a personal note, do you have kids? Two, yeah. Two kids? Nice. Uh, how old are your kids? Twins, almost. Oh, uh, yeah. They'll be 16 in August. Cool. Uh, What's your favorite uh, town to vacation in on the coastline of California with uh, your kids? Who thinks the best I would say I, I love San Diego, so I love Mission Bay. So it's a place that we go on vacation a lot, and it's great. It's active. We can rent boats and water ski and jet ski and camp, ride bikes. It's great. I'm asking you this selfishly because I'm, I'm going to spend the summer in California. I haven't decided where yet. We love Coronado. I've driven through Mission uh, Mission Bay. Is that yeah. how you say it? Mission Bay? Yeah. What's your, what do you think are your, uh, why do you guys like Mission Bay more so than uh, Coronado? Uh, just because of the active, the, the range of active activities and restaurants and everything right around. We can be, we can be on the beach playing volleyball and then we can be, you know, in the lagoon swimming. We can be biking. Like it, it, there's just, it's a much more, it seems like a more active environment with a lot of things very close. Cause you got Pacific beach, mission beach. We literally go around the entire Bay with our bikes all the time. So where do you go on vacation? I mean, outside of California, I mean, it's usually go. Um, so I played soccer over in Greece. And so we go to the Greek islands. And so I love it. I love Greece. I love um, Brazil, two places where I spend a lot of time. Awesome. London. Sorry. I keep, I keep uh, going all over the place. I've got all these questions I wanted to ask you and, I want to make sure we have enough time. So on the tech side, back to real estate, are you, are you investing? Are you, do you have any technology companies you're investing in? Yeah, so I've been building my own uh, technology platform, but it's different than most. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm investing in creating custom branded marketing pieces. So that way I can do my ancillary integrations. So if you're one of my agents, you could like, if you want to co do a marketing piece with my insurance company, as long as you're a preferred partner, the insurance company will proportionally pay for your postcards and they get a higher response rate because if it's going out from a trusted real estate advisor, it's not just a blanket solicitation from a, let's say another insurance person. So a lot of those people will trust their insurance, uh, their, their agent there. And so the insurance company gets a call. Um, so it would be like kind of two pronged marketing where the company, the office would pay a little bit of their marketing the agent would pay their piece and the insurance company would pay their piece. And then we do it through a checkout system. That's really cool. Do you, do you have a, um, for agents out there, real estate teams out there, when you kind of survey the market of agents and teams, do they have a favorite piece of technology they like to use? Is there something you hear come up over and over again that is something people really like to use or something you, you like personally on the tech side? Well, there, there are some companies that'll be in it. A lot of them will be integrated into our platform where they can come to our site and then it'll integrate for them. So everything from, we provide kind of data resources to our, to our folks, everything from data to we'll, we'll do agent advances to marketing advances where they could pay at the, at the time that they close a transaction. We'll just do it as almost on their DA where we get paid on the back end plus an interest rate. So we'll, like when the market changes and agents don't have the cash, we will literally lend them the money on their listings to do all the marketing that they want. And we will co-sponsor it at the market center level if they do certain criteria, like you, you gotta be in command. You have, to do, you have to use our smart plans that we think have the highest return rate and you have to do this and this and this. And with that, we will help to fund that and, um, and potentially drive more business to our agents. So we're trying to like make this as streamlined and do it through like i i'm a very analytical guy so i look at like if we do stuff we'll model out three different ways of doing it and then we'll see which one works the best and that will be our prototype that we will will be our primary requirement like use this part plan for this kind of contact and then we so we'll prescribe all that and then by the way we'll we'll help pay for it you just pay an, a small interest rate on the back end but meanwhile if we can help you to take two listings and get four deals out of it, then we've done our job on trying to help the agent to be better, right? Most of the agents are living hand to mouth. And by the time that they have the money in their bank account, that listing's already gone. They have lost the opportunity to really market it appropriately. The best time to market the listings on the front end to get two more listings than to wait till they get the cash to market it after the close. 
Right. That's all. That's really cool. That's a great idea. Well, how, what are you going to do with splits for your market centers? Like the splits when you give out the leads, like if you guys are spending money on lead gen, what are you going to? Uh, yeah. So our goal is to really, um, really turn on our lead gen system and then funnel the leads to the agents and it wouldn't count toward their cap, but they can opt into the program to get lead funnels as long as they, again, follow the model that we're telling them to follow. Just if you just follow this, we believe that you'll not only convert this lead, but hopefully get more business behind it. We're only looking to get the referral on the first lead. Hopefully we can then help them take one lead and again, convert that into four deals. So are you going to charge like a referral fee? It's like, Hey, if we give you leads yeah. 25% or 35%. Yeah. But I'll do like a 25% referral, but if they leave the company, then we'll get, we'll get 10% back for the previous 12 months, whatever they've closed instead of, so we'll give them at a discounted price versus 35%. But if they leave, then we get that 10% on everything closed. Are a lot of KW market center owners doing this, like pivoting to generating leads for their agents? The top ones are all kind of doing it. So I'm masterminding with different people around the country. And, and yes, we're trying to build the mousetraps right now. So because I've got so many businesses, I'm trying to figure out how, we, how do we centralize it and then create economies of scale and then start building it and driving the lead flow outward. You know, I, as I like think about the real estate landscape, you know, there's been some of these, you know, tech, quasi tech brokerages, if you want to call them that, like Compass and Rex and a few of the others that have popped up. There haven't been any like big brands pop up, like franchise brands. Would you agree with that? Like in the last 10, 15 years? The, the biggest one that's kind of trying to pop out in metropolitan areas is like a Corcoran group. Okay. The so Corcoran falls under the same uh, Realty brand. Right. And so it's just another yeah. variation of that brand. I guess, yeah, that's the only one I can think of. There aren't any really, like in the last 15 years, there haven't been a lot of like new franchisees pop, franchisors pop up. Yeah, it's, it, I, I don't see that being, um, you know, not that it's, it's going to be difficult to do that. Like part of it is, and the reason why you're seeing more tech is tech valuations will get a higher multiple than real estate. Compass, to be fair, they want to say that they're tech, they're really, they're, they're, they're a real estate company with a little bit of a tech component. But the reality is, like the fact that they went out and bought contactfully tells you that they couldn't, they couldn't even get their CRM to really work well. And so they had to go buy something. So it, you know, that was a smart acquisition, but it just, it just verifies that they weren't really a tech company to, to begin with, in my opinion. And they're yet they understood that getting a tech multiple would be the best way for them to get an exit strategy that could get them the highest multiple on the market. So it made sense for them to position themselves that, and they just kept telling that story enough times to enough people. So they started to believe it themselves, even though it's really not a tech company. Yes. Yeah. Is Redfin? Redfin's a tech company. Redfin's yeah. a tech company with real estate enabled. And the reality is, is Compass is really a real estate company with a little bit of a tech add-on feature. Inman did an article on what the ratio of um, technologists to the sales team and admin team, like what that ratio looked like. And um, what you just said is exactly what the article, you know, it's, the conclusion was uh, Zillow and, and Redfin are legitimate technology companies, but the others, you know, they have very, the ratio of technologists to sales and admin is like, you know, the complete opposite of Zillow and Redfin. Well, in, in your, your R&D credits, you can, like, from a tax basis perspective, like, if you were profitable, they, they weren't even profitable. It was really an insightful and not a surprise at all when, when they really shared what, like, what was under the hood with Compass, right? Like, you looked at their stock valuation, how much lower it was um, when they finally got to market, right? Like, they were positioning between $23 and $26 a share and then had to downgrade their stock value. And it's not a surprise because, again, once investors really understood that this is a real estate company, they're going to downgrade it to like where it's more appropriate. And then, and then again, when you look at the total capital raise, you know, it's, but, but, uh, but I'll tell you this, SoftBank really needed to hit a win there because SoftBank has really had problems. You know, they own 20% of Uber, the investor behind WeWork and WeWork is a disaster rolling out. I mean, that talk about a bad, potential positioning for IPO, that was really problematic. So SoftBank's in trouble as far as like from 
you know, from investors' wariness about investing behind the brands that they're putting out to the market and, and where they're coming up with their crazy valuations on, on, like, on their analysis and how they value themselves. Like, there's no relevance to their valuations as it relates to that. So, and I'm not talking about just companies. I'm talking about, like, SoftBank's valuations of multiple different businesses. So, uh, again, I think they needed, to, they needed to have a win with Compass. Yeah. Uh, do you know Josh Team? Yes. You do? Where, where did he go? He left KW, I, right? I have no idea where he went. Um, who's the most successful regional partner in the KW system? I, you know, I don't, I don't, to be honest, I keep my head down so much. I'm so busy with my own businesses that I don't put my head up very often. But you are um, the most successful KW franchisee though, right? Well, no, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say there's a lot of really good, successful franchisees out there. I think that, like, I, think, I, I, I would just, I would say that, like, if, if, if there's one thing that I do at a really high level, I'm very much an entrepreneur, business innovator. Like, like I'm a problem solver. Like, when I see a gap and someone says there's a problem, you know, I might complain for, like, all of five seconds, and I'm on to, like, okay, there's a gap. How do I monetize this? And I'm going to build a company that's going to, fill in the gap because if I'm having that problem, somebody else is and how do I make that happen? And I've done that repeatedly through my whole career, whether it's a staffing company that we sold, like that got to be a national staffing company and I sold out of that. And yet it's all over the country with all different brokerages. And, you know, I like, I look at Keller Williams for me as people say like, you could have your own independent. Why do you keep aligning and paying so much money in franchise royalties? I say, because Keller Williams for me is a distribution channel. And Gary taught me this early on. He's like, I need guys like you because you're a business innovator. You're going to challenge the status quo. You're going to make things better. I'm going to learn from people like you. And, and you're going to use my platform to grow your own business. And in return, it's going to be mutual beneficial to both. And even when like, he's got insurance, right? Even though I compete with them in certain spaces like insurance, He's okay with me competing in businesses that we even compete with, but, but he says like, and I understand that he's going to be soliciting my own agent for his own, you know, in, insurance opportunities. And he should, and I should have my own opportunity to grow and expand and do things and do things in a different integrated way. And doesn't mean like when he sees the kind of mousetraps I build and says this, Oh, this is really creative. Maybe, you know, maybe he buys parts of it. Like who knows? Like, when I built up my coffee shops, I went to him first and I said, here's my idea. This is the game plan. This is what I'm doing. I'm franchising this brand. I'm going to run it through all the real estate. And I believe it's the market of the future. And I want to call it KW Cafe, K-A-F-E. Do I have your blessing to do that? Like, and so I took it to um, head of legal and things like that. They're like, well, we can't, we can't have you do that. But build it out. Let's see what you're doing. I love the concept of what you're doing. So I built out three different models, a standard model, a large scale model and a micro model. And, 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 and you know, it, it's just creating business, business innovation for where I see the future. And I'm willing to put my money behind testing different models because, you know, I, I trust myself and I'm willing to fail and I'm willing to spend money failing um, because I know that like, you know, I'll hit a grand slam here and I'll have a double there and I'll, I'll fail on a different business. And at the end of the day, it washes out and I've done, I've done fine. So Rick, we got to sign out. I gotta, I gotta ask you one, one quick question before we go and uh, maybe hopefully get something a little controversial out of you. What do you think will be the biggest surprise in the real estate industry? For example, maybe it's some company that raised a bunch of money and they declare they're going to shut down and fold. Like, what do you think is going to be the biggest shock and awe in the industry um, over the next uh, you know, 12, 24 months? I think there's a lot of companies and a lot of leaders that underestimate Keller Williams and underestimate people like me that believe in the growth of this business. And by working together with like the top smart people in this industry, like Gary's on the forefront of teams, Keller Williams is on the forefront of stuff. I think that Keller Williams with, with a pot of money when it goes public, behind it to go reinvest into growth and expansion and putting money behind guys like me who are willing to go build incredible umpires with, with money and scale instead of my own capital. 
but to do it in a way that's more systematic and, and to the benefit of the agents and the company as a whole, I think that's going to be the, the one that everyone should be scared about. So did I hear you right that um, KW will likely go IPO? A hundred percent. Yeah, cool. What's the timeline on that? Soon. Ah, <laughs> nice. This is good. Sooner, man. sooner than I thought. I really um, believe, like, and I believe it's the right thing to do. And I, you know, and people are like, well, Gary, we said he would never sell. Like the market has changed and accessing capital and doing stuff now, like, like again, like an EXP went so early, like they're getting their wow time now. The reality is like Gary going to IPO now when he's still the Goliath and going to do that and, and with a reinvention and kind of like, I don't want to say a rebrand because they don't like, it's, it's kind of a reinvented double down with capital investment, like real investment into tech acquisition and tech development alongside improving the house of excellence with the luxury division really getting a strong commercial business really up and running and, and having Keller X like really, really grow in all the different capacities. There's a lot of revenue. So I, what I've been building is no different than Gary. It's just, he's on a totally different level, but again, me with infusion of cash is no different from Gary. Like I can go quadruple my businesses and my opportunities create opportunities for the rock star leaders that are in, in, in my organization and really create that with very structured high systems and go do it. And then again, I, I see Gary working side by side with people like me and others that are willing to go work with them to go make this incredibly, incredibly successful in the future. It doesn't have to be my business or his businesses, his business can sit right alongside me and even compete and we both can win. You yeah. don't have to lose. We can both win. Man, I can't even imagine what kind of valuation KW would get if Compass is getting like what, 10 billion or something, you know? I yeah, mean, but here's the difference. The multiple on KW, like their multiples are based not on GCI though. See, there's a difference. The, the multiples on GCI are like more with the franchisees. Because his revenue from the from the brokerage side of it is from the royalties where the valuations of KW are coming are from the MAPS coaching, from the events, through your $25 a month contribution to the tech. Like the money coming in, like the $500 KW Connect, the like... Because again, when you got scale like he does, you do $500 times whatever franchises have it part of their franchise agreements because not every market center has that in their franchise agreement as of yet. But, but I will say like when you do the math on all the multiples, you take a MAPS coaching and you think about how many MAPS coaches are out there and then that multiple times an X factor, that's where the valuations are coming. And then you've got Keller Mortgage and you've got Keller Offers and you've got you know, all, all the different pieces of the, the Keller X platform. But, but here's the thing, their biggest valuation is going to come from the, what they can develop with some capital into the true tech piece of the Keller X platform is where all the gold is at. That's where the gold is at. Because here's what I know about Keller Williams leadership. Like we are very loyal, committed, like Gary tells us to read a book, that book, all he has to do is say it. And that book has got 300 purchases by the time he's done with that call, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's got a loyal following. And because of that, if we can get the eyeballs of our consumers and our agents to use the products and the integration with command, then that tech platform will be the highest valuation of the tech platform out there and, and will far exceed anything that you've seen from a Zillow or a Redfin or something like that. It's the tech piece, not the real estate piece. And I really believe that he pivoted from being a, a real estate company to saying, no, we got to be a tech company because of the valuation multiple. And that's where the money's at. And we need to pivot because that's where I believe that's probably one of the smartest moves behind the scenes that we weren't in the room to discuss. But I can just imagine what that conversation was. And I would do the same thing. That's awesome. Well, that's a great way to end out the show. Rick, what's a way for people to reach out to you if they want to learn more about you or joining one of your market centers on the West Coast? Well, um, cunninghamre.com is our website. 
So CunninghamRE.com. So if you want to send real estate um, deals to my team, my team is actively selling. So would love, uh, would love to drive business to my team. And like our website company, that's an example of our luxury websites that are available for sale. <laughs> but my, yeah, for leadership, you know, people can join my calls. Like, like on Monday, I run my team calls for all my offices. This Monday, I have the NFL quarterback that back up Tom Brady and just won the Super Bowl is my speaker this week to give you an idea of the level I try to bring value to my people. So, awesome. you know, like stuff like that. So when I'm in, uh, when I'm on the West coast this summer, we gotta, we gotta connect and get together. For sure. Absolutely. Rick, thanks for being on the show. And um, I look forward to connecting with you again, uh, guys, if this is your first time tuning into CEO secrets, be sure to hit that subscribe button. You can always watch us on YouTube. If you want to see us live, um, we've also got our private Facebook group, Chris Waters Rainmaker Alliance. We'll publish this live. And uh, of course, on um, all the uh, typical places like iTunes and Spotify, et cetera. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Bye, everybody.